Please turn your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 8. And as promised last hour, we will read um, our reading tonight, today. It's night somewhere. Is <laughs> John 8, 31 through 59. So Jesus was saying to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will set make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you will say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin and the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things you heard from your, your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. The Jews answered and said to him, do we not rightly say you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died. The prophets also. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham, who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. And you have not come to know Him, but I know Him. And if I say I do not know Him, I will be a liar like you. I do know Him and keep His word. Your father rejoiced to see, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and yet you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore, he picked up, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Once again, I mean, I, hopefully you could see that, even though that was a little longer than our normal reading sessions, why I can't break that part up. I mean, that is so amazing and powerful. Um, and I encourage everyone who is, who, if this is the first time reading it, read it again. Uh, it really hits home as to exactly the nature of who Jesus is. Now I turn over to the book of Ephesians. We're in Ephesians 1 through 14. And before we do our review, let's go ahead and pray. God, heaven, thank you for your truth. The truly amazing... Uh, account and recording of your words in your book by the apostles. Help us to believe if we do not. 
help us to understand if we do not. Have their word be true and our thoughts melt away. We thank you that your word is truth. And we pray that we do, in accordance with your word, come into conformity with your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We're, uh, when it comes down to typical lessons, verse-by-verse verse lessons, there are some passages that that you kind of like you, you're able to kind of go through with a kind of a, a relative ease. It kind of this, the flow makes sense. And then eventually you come up to a passage or a verse and you just if you want people to not have a question about it and you want to make sure that you do it justice. You really have to stop and go, we need to look at the DNA of a particular passage. And the DNA then spreads over to various passages. That's what's going to happen in verse five today. In, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, a quick review of this, uh, verses 1 and 2, the passage is a consistent reminder that our love must imitate the love of God for us. Since we are born of God, we are his beloved children, we need to live our lives as an example of his love. Um, well, it's, it's, a, it's a well-written passage by Paul. It's, it's easily understood. There's not much confusion, and, uh, and it, it really rings true to who we are in Christ. Then he goes on and tells them what the problem is, but immorality and, and, and impurity and greed must not be even named among you. See, the acts of fornication, impurity, and greed cannot be something that is known amongst the saints. Paul then uses three unique words. Um, and I, I don't know what I was doing. I was copying and pasting, and I thought I copied and pasted the rest of that, but that, I'll go ahead and just tell you. It expresses not concept of, of how you communicate to one another. And they're weird, because filthiness, silly talk, and coarse jesting, I don't, I don't think the translations do any justice there. Go back and listen to it if you want, or read my notes uh, on verse 3 and verse 4. But there is definitely a concept of how we speak to another that has to be done in accordance with his truth. And it's not just a, a coarse jesting. It's it's a it's a it's the concept of being uh, wit, a kind of a wit, but in a very negative where you're hurting people by your words, and that has to be not done. And then in verse five, we deal with this concept, and this concept is echoed three times in the New Testament, talking about those who do not inherit the kingdom of Christ and God. In various different forms, the language may twist a little bit, but the do not inherit the kingdom is definitely something that's repeated three times. Here in Ephesians, Galatians 5, and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe. My notes. Yes, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Reading it, it says, For this you know with certainty. That no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, literal translation. Um, in the, emphasis, the emphatic nature of this verse is highly intense. It's very intense in the, in the reading. Taking this from the Greek and, gra and grasping it in, in full concept, it is, it's, it's, it is very charged with emotion and intensity for this you must fully know knowing that any immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater has no inheritance in the kingdom of christ and god now obviously there is possible confusion we all have been through ephesians ephesians 1 through 4 and we have seen consistent language, especially in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, that in order to be saved, in order to have eternal life, to have an inheritance of God, it is simply by grace through faith only. And that sin is paid for. And good behavior is not a requisite. Although it is a charge throughout the book, as a believer, do good works including chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And then he says that immorality, impurity, and greed must not be named amongst the saints. 
And then he gets into this particular phrase. And we have to ask the obvious question. Does this say that regardless of a person's belief in Jesus, if they're being immoral, impure, or greedy, cause or indicate that that person does not have eternal life or is saved? If you read this on the onset and, you, and you're and you very, I'm um, just reading it and you're not really paying attention to the context. I think the context bears out clearly what this is saying. But even if you're if you're just read that verse by itself, what does it tell you you need to do to have an inheritance in the kingdom of God? If you want an inheritance in the kingdom of God, you cannot be immoral, impure, greedy, or an idolater. Does uh now Ephesians 5, 5 is kind of like, okay, I can not be immoral. I can not be impure. I can not be greedy, although that can be a little tough at times, right? I can not be an idolater. I don't think I've ever bowed down to any type of wooden statue recently, right? And you go, okay, I can handle that. Then go to Galatians 5. Five, Galatians 5, Galatians 5.21, and we'll actually it starts at 19 through 21, does not stop at three or four things. And when you start really dealing with a person and their sin, and, and a person who thinks they have to avoid certain sins in order to have an inheritance, I like to take them to 5.21 and say, do you do this too? Are you this good? The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity. Boom, right off the bat, kind of it, it echoes what we see in Ephesians 5. Sensuality, idolatry, okay. Sorcery, yeah. enmities, oh. Strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, like today at 3 through 5 o'clock. <laughs> One of us in this room will have some outbursts of anger. I guarantee it. Disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and just in case I forgot some, the things like these. To which we go, oh yeah. Until we get about halfway down that list, we're feeling pretty good about ourselves. Just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, Ephesians 5 5, we can say right now, is not an exclusive list. And there are many opinions, many, 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 I'm not sure if I have enough many's memorized, in order to express how many opinions there are about what this verse means, Galatians 5.21, Ephesians 5.5, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. What do these verses mean? So how do we go about dealing with this? Well, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, we are going to take this very slowly, methodically, and approach it carefully so that the questions concerning this text will be answered systematically, so that you have at least a fully grasp based upon the, uh, the, the the methodology that we use when approaching Scripture. Remember how we deal with it? Literally or normatively, grammatically, and historically. We also abide by the rules of biblical interpretation, which says that I do not come at it with my own interpretation. And I don't, we don't, I, I'll quote Paul, if you will, Paul Myers, uh, you know, up in, up in heaven, hopefully smiling down upon this one, because he knows, um, <laughs> right? And says, I don't care what you think. You shouldn't care what I think. You should care what it says. What does it say? So we're not about opinions here, although we do express some. We, we want to make sure that what the Bible says is understandable and clear and undisputable. And if it is disputable, then we have a choice. We have to say, okay, there's possibilities. Carl Denzi is famous for this, right? There's possible, there's probable, there's absolute certainty. It's 
Sometimes it's a cop-out. I agree. <laughs> but at times we have to be able to say, what is this saying? For sure. Or there are two possibilities which also are correlated with other texts within Scripture. If we are going to say that Christ died for sins, how many sins? All sins. And how do you go to heaven? You believe in him. But if you do any bad things, then he's going to cast you to hell. That doesn't make any sense. Then he didn't pay for all sins. He only paid for some sins. And he only paid for sins that you might only do every once in a while, but not things that you do repet repetitively. How many sins does it take? Am I in trouble? I don't know. It, 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 does it take to account from the moment I first believed when I was like nine? Or does it account from this point on? I don't know. And it becomes problematic. So how are we going to approach this? Number one, we're going to deal with this verse word by word, painfully, excruciatingly, word by word, to make sure that we have a proper understanding of the translation and then correlate that and make sure we understand the words properly. Number two, we're going to do what we did in our uh, discernment class, where we are going to look at, and this is going to happen next week, by the way. No way I could do this in one hour. Next week, we're going to look at various different interpretational models where we're going to say, this is what this group of people say or a person says, and this is what one group of people, and we're going to go ahead and compare and contrast with the word of God, what they say, and if it's consistent with the truth. Then finally, we are going to correlate and coordinate all these verses together, Ephesians 5, 5, Galatians 5, 21, and 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, and come up with a, with a understandable grasp over what all these verses say and what they do not say. I think I can demonstrate by the third lesson absolutely and with clarity not only what this does not say, but what it does say. And so that you can have confidence when dealing with this passage, because this passage, for a lot of people, scares them. Especially, especially the Galatians 5.21, because it adds a lot more than just hey, uh, for, uh, fornication and, and idolatry and, and, sens and those, those types of things, which are easily avoidable. They're very overt, very easily recognizable, and you say, oh, I, I don't do those things. Okay, I'm good. So, starting out with a word-for-word -word translation. For this you know... It begins with the word gar. Now, gar, if you have actually a Greek translation, um, it's actually the second word. It's post-positive. It's how the Greek works. We still deal with it first. Gar is simply a conjunction that assigns a reason or explanation. Uh, you can either say for or because. Very simple word. In this context, okay, just looking at verse, verses 5, 1 through 5, he is giving information in verses 3 and 4 and then follows up with a because. So Paul tells them not to have immorality, impurity, or greed be named among them. You can stop there. You can skip four if you want, because you'll see the correlation between the words. And then ask your question, why? This is how we do exegetical outlining, by the way. Why? Why? Why, Paul? Why do we not have immorality, impurity, or greed named amongst us? Why? Well, because any immoral, impure, or greedy persons have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of Christ, however you want to say it, all the same thing. Then he says, for this you know. Now the word this is hutas, pointing to a thing, or in this case, a statement. You, this you know. And then he goes on and tells them what they know. Well, in actuality, the word know is oida. Oida is in the perfect, but interestingly enough, it's in the imperative. And I, for the life of me, you know, like you, as, as you study Greek in, in the New Testament for, for 15, 20 years, and then you go, what? I don't think I've ever seen this before. A perfect imperative? How can something be in the perfect imperative? Imperative implies something that's futuristic. I can't tell you to do something in the past. And I, and, and I even asked um, my, my linguist son-in-law, ever heard of a perfect indicative? I mean, perfect imperative? He goes, no, <laughs> that's weird. But it happens in Greek. An imperfect imperative, again, which is strange, basically takes the idea of oida, which is to know and know completely, and then turns it into an imperative. Every single instance of oida in the New Testament is always in the perfect tense. And so some people say, ignore the tense, that perfect tense, because it's always in the perfect tense. I say, I think it should be in the perfect tense, 
properly. Now, there's two other instances, only two other instances where, where oida is used in the perfect imperative. And that's Hebrews chapter 12. I'll have it up here for you, just to go ahead and show them to you. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit a blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for, for repentance, although he sought it, that is the, 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 uh, the inheritance, with tears. That is dealing with, um, I almost said Cain and Abel. It said Esau, okay? It's translated again, for you know. It's in the perfect imperative. James 1.19 says, this you know, my beloved brethren, be, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Again, in the perfect imperative for no. Now, looked at it, retranslated all three of these passages, and here's what I've concluded. That the perfect imperative is a highly emphatic and used term to have the action. He wants them to know something. And if and he, he goes, you, I want you to really pay attention to this because I want you to know it so well that it has a, a perpetual or lasting effect. I want you to know it so well, it's as if you've always known it, basically. So the information in Hebrews, James, and Ephesians, the authors are assuming they don't know it fully but they already should have. And so therefore, think about this very carefully. The statement that follows is what must be fully known. This is why I translate this in my literal translation. You must fully know. So he's commanding them to have a perfect understanding, a complete understanding of what he's about to say. In the NASB, the next phrase or the next word are, is with certainty. Very interesting because with certainty, it's, it's, it's a participle of gnosko. Gnosko is a verb that means to know and recognize or to, to, to know, to come to know or to learn. It's different than oida, which has a perfect concept. You know this is kind of like second nature. Gnosko is a learned concept. The, the Christian Standard Bible, or the formerly the Holman Christian Standard Bible, if you have an HCSB, is the only one that I saw that came close to having Gnosko uh, put into the text. Because I've never seen Gnosko ever be, be translated uh, with certainty. Some people try to claim it's like a Hebraism, uh, a turn of phrase. You have an oida with a Gnosko. Um, okay. I, I don't know. Um, but recognize is not in the imperative. It's participle. This is why I have chosen to make keep this very simple and just simply translate this as knowing. For you know this, and then he goes into the statement knowing, which is very typical of Paul and how he speaks. It's strange if you have different translations because the, <clears throat> the King James Version and other versions ignore this. They just ignore the gnosko. They just say, for knowing this, or for, for you know this. And I'm going, where's the gnosko? And they don't have it. Uh, the NASB adds it with certainty. And again, the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, seems to be the only one that gets this, at least, at least has it in the context. So I believe the gnosko is actually part of the statement that Paul is making, that he wants them to know and know emphatically. The, phrase, the following phrase is vital. So the following phrase in verse 5 is vital to understand or grasp why verses 3 and 4 are so important. Why would he tell them that immorality, impurity, and greed must not even be named among you? Why? And he goes, you need to understand exactly what's going on in the world. The next phrase, that no immoral, impure, or covetous man. Now, first thing I want you to point out here is that it has the no or the, or the or is connected to the immoral, impure, or covetous man. In actuality, the negative particle is connected to the verb has. Which is why I had it translated. 
at any immoral, because there is a pause at all, uh, every single one of the immoral, impure, or greedy persons who is an idolater has no inheritance. So the has no, the, the no is connected to the verb, not to these particular individuals. And, and it, it's not really that big of a deal when it comes down to understanding the, the, the text fully. However, I believe the emphasis is incorrectly placed. I believe the emphasis is properly placed at the end or the last part of this particular verse. Now, there are words that are indicative of sin and immorality that are nearly identical to verse 3. Okay, so once again, let's look at verse 3 and just understand, and you can see it very easily, immorality, impurity, greed. In verse 5... Immoral, impure, covetous. Uh, I'll let you know now that covetous and greed are the same word. Uh, they're cognates of the same word. And if you take, if you have a blue letter Bible, uh, which you can have, you can pull it up in such a way that you can see the actual Greek word order with a, a transliteration and a translation of the particular word. So here we have in verse three, porneia, okay, impurity, greed. So you have the words here. And you can go ahead and go on to verse 5, and if you're very quick and looking, you can see that immoral, impure, and covetous are the exact same. Well, they're not the exact same words. I'll explain that in a second. They're different, but they're nearly identical. The same words. In fact, if you take a look at it, in verse 3 we have porneia, which is basically translated into any illicit sexual activity. This goes from... Any type of concepts as far as illicit sexual activity. It covers adultery, it covers um, uh, fornication outside of marriage, and it covers, you know, just strange stuff too. <clears throat> In verse 5, we have the word pornos. Again, everyone can see the word and how this is used typically in English and how it's translated over, right? Uh, you can see that both these ideas in Greek are transferred over to the, to the English understanding of pornography. But pornos is used 10 times in the New Testament and always indicates a person or a group of people that are known for their sexual immorality or fornication. That's how they're identified. So here we have the illicit activity in verse 3, and then an individual or people, a group, that is identified by their sexual immorality or fornication. Similarly, a catharsia is in verse 3, a cathartos is in verse 5. A catharsia is a perversion of various sorts. It refers to activity of a person, and it does not describe the person. Or a catharsis is an adjective that describes something that is unclean or impure. Most of the time, if you look at this, ver if you look at this adjective in the New Testament, it is normally used to describe unclean spirits. What is an unclean spirit? Is it a spirit that didn't take a bath that morning? No. An unclean spirit is demonstrative of demonic activity. It can refer to food, an unclean food. For example, pork to the Jew was unclean, impure. Vessels, they have both Vessels that are impure and vessels that are sacred, either jars or, or forks. Or people. People can be impure. So you have activity that is impure, and then you have things that are impure, food, vessels, or people. Uncleanliness is not just a lack of cleanness. It is something that defiles Typically, this is something that is associated with foreign gods, which we will see later on that a foreign god is not a god, it's demonic. Or that which is seen to be an abomination. It covers a wide variety of different things that was considered to be an abomination. In verse 3, we have planexia, which is the desire for more, an, act, an activity of working towards that which is desired, which translated greed better than coveting. 
Planectes describes a person or a group that are seen or known for their greed. So here right off the bat, we have in verse 3, activity. In verse 5, we have identification. You all see that? Who is an idolater? Now, it's not a question. You type that into like a Word document. It always says, you forgot your question mark. I'm not asking a question. It's a demonstrative phrase. And here I had to stop and, and, and talk about this. In fact, I, Luther and I had a discussion even last night because I'm going, this, is, this, this threw me off a little bit because I've taught Colossians 3.5, and there's a similar phrase there in dealing with this particular, all of this verse 5. The verb I me is translated is, okay, and it's used here to, de to, to demonstrate a person's status, someone who is an idolater. Idolatry is the activity of bowing down, literally bowing down, worshiping, or honoring idols. A person who performs idolatry, they go into temples, they bow down, and they worship other idols. They go ahead and do the bidding. They, 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 sac they sacrifice meat on an altar to a different god. It's called an idolater. And this is one of the most egregious activities in the eyes of God. Do we know anybody in Scripture, let's go ahead and go back to the Old Testament, who is a fantastic individual, wise beyond all of his years, glorious, and the king of Israel who was an idolater? Almost every single other king, but Solomon, at the end, played the harlot with God and sought after other gods at the end. If you go all the way through his life, he man, he is he is it. He is he's he's David without the blood. And yet at the end, idolater. You see, when you're dealing with idolatry, it's the most egregious activities in the eyes of God. This is the number one reason why Israel had issues, is because of idolatry. In Romans chapter 1, turn over to Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 25. I want you to, to see exactly the spiral effects, the concepts here that are found within Romans chapter 1. Allow for an individual to understand and grasp the ideas of why it is so bad or how God views it, if you will. Okay, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And what did they do? They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image, root word for idol, by the way, in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. They're like, hey, centipede, that's a cool God. Really? No, not spiders. Never been a God. That's a demon. <laughs> Therefore, God gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity. Why did God give them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them? Because they exchanged the glory of God for image of forms of corruptible man, of birds, and four-footed beasts, and crawling creatures. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The lie is an idolatrous nature. When you go ahead and say, uh, okay, there's a God up there who created the world, but I really want to go ahead and worship this God, the God of rain, the God of sun, the God of sticks. I remember watching a Veggie Tales. You know, they bowed down to sticks and mud. I'm like, oh, 
that's was, was hilarious uh, how they played idolatry. Um, but that's exactly how people did. They, 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 they worshipped alligators. They worshipped owls. They worshipped various different beasts. And we know, we, we know, we can think of various places in the world, even within our own backyard, that fully embraces and deals with idolatry. We know people that worship cows. I don't get it. I don't know why this is sacred. We know places that, that still have little idols around their neck, in their homes, and they pray to them. It's still, I mean, people are like, oh, idolatry. No, it's not. No, idolatry is not gone. It may not be prevalent amongst evangelical Christians, but it is definitely prevalent. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want you to really pay attention to this one. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you got you to gotta, you gotta probably do a little bit of research, understand the historical nature of Corinth. And he tells them directly in verse 14, Therefore, my beloved brethren, flee from idolatry. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole context there, but the next passage I want you to see is in the same chapter in verses 19 through 20. I want you to mark this because Paul explains what an idol actually is. What do I mean then? That, a, that things sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. But I say the things that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. So if a person is, is, is worshiping an idol, I don't care how well intended it is. If they're worshiping an animal or an image or a little wooden statue, even if you call it godly and give it godly attributes, it is not God. And you are actually worshiping, bowing down to, serving, honoring demons. It's the opposite of God. So idolatry is very clear. Edos, a figure, a picture, a copy, whether physically made or materials or natural currents, stones, star, man. Anything can be an idol if you say that's God. Some people make it, they fashion it from their own hands and make it into an image. Some people just have a stone fall from heaven. What do we call that? A meteor? It lands, they go, oh, that's God. Okay, weird. Have you ever seen that? It's a place in the Middle East. And they go around there, they make little travels to it, and they circle it, trying to touch it. But there's like thousands of people who are perpetually there, circling this stone, thinking that this is some type of image of God. Or, of course, men. Men claim to be God. Some people believe them. I don't understand it. There's only one that was ever a man, and it's God, and that's Jesus. So, understanding, it's incontrovertible that recognizing, worshiping, sacrificing, or following the prophets of an idol is an abomination in the Hebrew Scriptures. I don't think we need to go back and look at all the different idolatry in the Hebrew text. And it was the main cause for judgment for Israel. The reason why the, the kingdom, the Israeli kingdom, was divided was because of idolatry. Solomon's idolatry. Jehovah is the only God. And he does not share glory with another. And a person who makes up a God or is fooled to believe that other gods exist are considered by Jehovah, that is the Old Testament name for God, or Yahweh, if you will, to be his enemies. They're following after demons. They're following after the deceiver, that is Satan. The reason that this, for, for our, our, our kind of nailing this down as best we can, is from 1 Corinthians 10. They're not really idols. You're not, you're not dealing with a false guy. You're not dealing with a fake guy. You're not dealing with just a piece of wood. You're dealing with an image of a demon. And a person who does that are not really just fooled. They are being partakers in the satanic lie in this world. The world that's established by Satan, and, you're, and they're falling for that. This is the problem with idolatry. 
So again, idols are not really idols, but in fact, they're representatives of demons and are part of the satanic lie in place in this world since sin entered the world. This has been the satanic lie from the beginning. Not that God, not the God of creation. That God's false. This other one is basically me. That's how Satan does it. Now, here's what I want you to do. Keep your hand, go back to Ephesians 5. I want you to point out something. Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, 5. Because in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, and I'll pull that up here first, you'll see very, uh, a very similar language. Okay? Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, and keep your hand in Ephesians 5, 5. In Colossians 3, 5, it says, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly bodies as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. And you go, hey, that sounds very close to what we're dealing with in Ephesians 5. And you go, you're right. Now, they're all the same cognates of words. So there, there's, there's various different ideas of what's happening here. It's idolatry, not idolater. Okay, so you're dealing with activity, not identification. That's important. And at 5, 5, of course, you have the concepts here which deal with the idea of individuals or who they're, how they're known, not necessarily what they're, you know, it's, it's what they do, but it's, it's how they're identified. And I, but it got me thinking here because I have taught, and I talked this over with Luther, and we both have taught this, that idolatry is akin to greed. Have you heard this before? Some have taken idolatry and make it any sin. Have you ever heard that? That when you like watch too much television, that's your that's your God. When when you work too much for the money, that's your God. When you love your wife too much, your wife becomes your God. When you live your life for your kids, your your kids become your God. Now I'm not saying any of those activities are good. God should be your number one. But it's not the same as idolatry. Idolatry is fashioning things. And looking at things and say, that's God. That's what you believe. I, that, that, that's our God. That little thing there that I just made. And so the question comes into is this little idea of who, or well, back over in Colossians 3, 5, the which, which amounts. And we've often tied these together with which ties to greed and who, in Ephesians 5, who is tied to covetous man. But I want you to see something here. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, the who is in the, is in the singular neuter. All of these other words are in the masculine. Okay? Immoral, impure, greedy man is in the masculine. To which some commentators say, oh, I think that the who then refers to all of it. To which I, I disagree. I'll tell you why in a second as well. So this got me thinking about this and considering of what this is exactly talking about. So in my evaluation of dealing with the entire context of what this is going on in idolatry, um, I believe that these relative pronouns and these pronoun phrases in these passages should be seen as independent from the list or greed itself. Idolatry does not equal to greed. Greed does not equal to idolatry. A sin is not equal to idolatry. What is idolatry? Idolatry is idolatry. Is idolatry still alive and well in this in this planet today? Absolutely. Typically, do we involve ourselves in idolatry? No. That's different. If you're going to head and say that everything is idolatry, um, <laughs> then why even list other sins? Does it make sense? David committed murder. David, adultery. David, so he falls in moral, impure, and covetous. David was all these three. Never once was he ever called an idolater. Who was called an idolater? Solomon. When? When he had 3,000 wives? No. When his 3,000 wives said, hey, why don't you go and have this guy? He goes, okay, now he's an idolater. Okay, you see the difference here? So the Old Testament, New Testament identification of idolatry remains the same. So I believe that the relative pronoun phrase is used in order to have idolatry stand apart. 
If you were to, you could take out the list in Colossians 3, 5, and it still makes sense. Therefore, that which is idolatry, consider as dead the members of your earthly body. And it still makes sense. In Ephesians 5, 5, knowing that one who is an idolater has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God, and it still makes sense. So the, 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 the phrase itself does not need an antecedent. It's simply identification. The reason I bring that up is because there's a lot of people out there in churches and radio and televisions and books who equate every single sin to idolatry, and I don't want you to be confused by that. You should flee from greed. You should flee from immorality. You should flee from impurity and other various lists from from Galatians 5 as well. You should not be doing those things, and idolatry is amongst the list, not covering at all. Otherwise, you just think that every single time you commit a sin, you're an idolater. And I go, that's, no. No. That's different. So the actions of fornication, impurity, and greed are all in, 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 internal, where idolatry is an influence of the world of the demons. You know, I did not make this observation. I was talking with Luther, and he goes, hey, fornication, impurity, greed, that's all kind of coming from within. Idolatry comes from that. I go, oh, my gosh. How did I miss that? Thanks, Luther. You took like two seconds to look at it for me. <laughs> Every once in a while, man, you just like fresh eyes. And I go, now it makes even more sense. Because idolatry is kind of like that demonic force surrounding us going, Wah, come on, let's go ahead and worship these gods. And, and you're fighting that, especially in the old times, right? The old times was different. You know, just, we, we, know, we know better now. Imagine living in the 900s, you know, and you didn't know what the sun was. Why does this thing keep going around here? I don't know what's happening. And you think it's a God. So the fact that this is separate as far as the, the, where, the, where, where it comes from, I think really plays again into the concept that this idea of idolatry is just idolatry. Finally, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. As previously stated, the negative particle is with the verb. Has no inheritance. And that ook, that oo, is very emphatic. None. Zero is not an inheritor of the kingdom of Christ and God. The word echo and ook are used together. Has no, no. Not having. However you want to say it, it's very emphatic in how it's being used. It's, there's no possession. Echo is that concept of possession, to have, to own, and you have no inheritance. The negative particle ook is an absolute negative particle, which means that these persons have absolutely no inheritance. Inheritance is kleromia. Kleromia is, comes from kleros. Kleros means lot, portion, or a share. Namas is law which means that if you are an heir, you have a rightful legal claim to a portion of what is left by your parents. This is why we have probate courts, right? That sometimes there's a person who is a rightful heir who says, I deserve part of that. And the person goes, I didn't even know it existed. Doesn't matter. I'm a rightful heir. And they fight over their inheritance. A person cannot be unnamed because they were bad. They can give it up in accordance with legal standards within, within our laws or within normal human activity. But you can't just say, ah, they're not mine. They are yours by law. The word in its cognate of, of this idea of inheritance is used throughout Scripture repeatedly. Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. For the promises to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be an heir of the world. Same word or a cognate of it. Was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and promises nullified. What? That's, that's different than what we just read in 5.5, 5, that those who are immoral, that's the people who don't get it. Well, if that's true, then those who are of law are heirs. And then the promise, and then faith is made void and promise is nullified. Because the Bible clearly says, don't be immoral. Don't be an idolater. That's the law. Uh, how do I know? Um, Exodus 20? Have you ever read it? 
I mean, that's the, that's the basics, right? Immorality, adultery, idolatry, having God before me. Romans 8, chapter 16 through 17. How do you become an heir? The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, bless what? Heirs. Heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Since we suffered with him so that we also would be glorified with him. Galatians chapter 3, verse 18. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted to Abraham by means of a promise. Galatians 3.29. And if you belong to Christ and you're Abraham's descendants, heirs, going all the way back to Romans chapter 4. Now, not heirs in Israel. We talked about that before in, um, in our dealing with the kingdom conference. We're not heirs in, in Israel, but we are heirs of the kingdom, which spills out into the rest of the world. Galatians chapter 4, verse, verses 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption, legal sons. Because you are sons, he has sent forth the spirit of, his, of the son to our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and of a son, an heir through God. You get in the picture? Titus 3, 7. So that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heirs. So who has an inheritance? In Ephesians chapter 1, it's very clear. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, or basically we, uh, believers have a destiny, a destiny according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we would be first to hope in Christ would be the praise of his glory. Skipping down to verse 13, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance. With a view to the redemption of God's own possession, the praise of his glory. Verse 18, I pray that your eyes will be enlightened so that you will know the hope of his calling, which are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Ephesians 3, 6, to be specific, that Gentiles and our fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. How does somebody become an inheritance, an heir? How does somebody have an inheritance? By promise, not law. By faith, not by works. By being a child of God. And how do you become a child of God? He makes you a child of God when you believe. This is something you are born into. Now, it's not born as in like my fleshly parents, but my heavenly father who makes me alive. So my born from above, sometimes translated born again, I am now an heir. And I don't earn it. So, how do we read verse 5 then in Ephesians 5.5? 5, 5? We can conclude... In Ephesians 5, 5, that those who are identified as a fornicator, impure, greedy, and idolater is not a believer in Jesus Christ. What came first, the chicken or the egg? I saw a meme online. I ordered a chicken and an egg from Amazon. We'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. And this is the question. We're, we're identifying Ephesians 5.5 5 as unbelievers. But did, were they believers who became unbelievers? That's, that's a question for next week. Yes, it's already noon. Now, we could go to 3. We don't have anything to do until 3, right? I'm kidding. So let's pray. We'll pick it up in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, 5 again, dealing with the question of what, why, what caused them to be unbelievers, okay? Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you so much for your word that we can go through this text very clearly, look at the words and all of its context and understand the words and its definitions, cross-reference throughout all your word, which is beautiful, and understand what these things mean appropriately. Help us to be discerning, to be careful, to understand, to not put words in your mouth, but let the word of God speak clearly for itself. And above all, 
help us help us understand the difficult, which this can be difficult in verse five, with the simple, like Ephesians one. We thank you for that. We praise you for you are our God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.